Hi everyone, I'm Joanna Penn from thecreativepen.com and today I'm here with DJ Williams. Welcome, Derek. Hi, Joanna. How are you? Good to be here. <laughs> it's great to have you on the show. Just a little introduction. Derek is a TV executive director and producer with more than 400 episodes of broadcast TV syndicated worldwide. He's also the author of three novels, including The Auctioneer, described as Born meets Bond meets National Treasure, which is right down my alley in the uh, action adventure <laughs> space. So, Derek, just start by telling us a bit more about you and your career in uh, writing and t TV and film? Sure. After that introduction, I feel like I need a vacation. <laughs> I feel like I've been working way too hard. Um, you know, I was born and raised in Hong Kong, so I'm, a, I'm an expat to some degree. Uh, moved back to L.A. when I was 15. Ended up getting into the music business for a long time, uh, producing records. I owned uh, a couple indie labels. And then when iTunes came along, all of us had to revamp our career. Mm -hmm. And I got a phone call from a friend who said that they were shooting a pilot for a new show. And he said, I want you to come out and direct the pilot. And I said, well, I've never directed TV before. And he said, well, how hard can it be? Just show up, act like you know what you're doing. So I flew out to Indiana and we shot the pilot. And the pilot took off, and I think we're in season 16 of that that particular show. And, you know, it was just one of those things. I said yes and took a risk, and it's been uh, 12 years. I've been, I've been working in the TV world and very grateful to always have work because that's one of the challenges, you know. So, yeah. Yeah, fantastic. Well, then it's really interesting because um, a lot of people romanticize the TV and film industry, I guess. And people be like, well, why would you write novels then? Why, why would you do that? <laughs> so, so why get into writing novels? What, what does that give you that's different? You know, when, when I was in the music business, uh, everything from producing records to promoting and marketing the records or artists, I always kind of saw myself as a storyteller. And so whether, you know, music was the outlet at that point. Now on the TV side, we do a lot of unscripted shows, but you're still storytelling. You know, if you're interview if someone's being interviewed, you're still trying to tell their story. Um, but there was a point in my life where I was at a crossroads kind of in my career. And I found myself uh, on the Zambezi River in a tent for three days uh, with wild animals all around me. I'm a total city boy, so that, that was quite an adventure. And uh, one morning I got up, I was looking out on the river, and I thought, uh, we kind of back up just a, a little bit, we were shooting a documentary over there. So we had been there for three weeks filming, had seen all kinds of amazing things and met all kinds of amazing people. And that morning on the Zambezi, I looked out on the river and I thought, one day I'm going to write about this place. And I didn't know what that would look like, uh, but I, you know, came home and it's kind of how it is. You live one of those adventures and you come home and life's back to the, to the grind and you're working and you're doing all, I put it on the shelf for a while and then I picked it up probably about three or four years later and I thought I'm going to write a novel, but I'm not going to tell anybody. And so I wrote the whole thing, didn't even tell my wife I was writing. She had no idea what I was doing. And when it was done, I sent it out to a friend of mine. Uh, her name's Judith McCreary. And Judith was a co-executive producer on Law & Order, SVU, Criminal Minds, and CSI. And I said, Judith, if this is really bad, then the only people that will know this exists are <laughs> you and me. And she read it, and she happened to be writing a script for, uh, I think it was Lifetime at, at the time. Um, about human trafficking. Well, the first novel I wrote had to do with human trafficking. And so she called me up a couple days later and she said, you've got to, you got to get this out. You got to do it. So that was kind of the push I needed to take that step forward. And, you know, it's actually a good outlet because when we're doing the TV stuff, you know, you're with, you know, camera crews and a lot of guests and, and you're, you know, we also shoot like pilots that we pitch to the networks and you can be around a lot of people. And so when I'm writing the novels, kind of that's the exact opposite. 
So you're by yourself, and I kind of like that. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been just a good kind of one-two punch, you know, for me. Mm. And I'm interested because, of course, you said you were in the indie music scene as well. Um, yeah. So how are, you, how are you doing your publishing? Are you, are you kind of indie <laughs> through and through, or, or what are you doing? You know, I, I've, I had an agent, and we pitched the projects. The first two books I wrote were – uh, not edgy enough for kind of a commercial house. And so with the auctioneer, which is the latest book, that's very commercial. Uh, it's got all the, you know, checks all the boxes for a great action adventure story. So, you know, we shop that around. Uh, the one thing I've learned is, you know, if you're looking for a literary agent, cause I have a TV agent and it works for what we do. But with a literary agent, you need to find someone that specializes in the genre that you're writing in. Mm. And so I had an agent that specialized in a different kind of genre. So that was very difficult because they didn't necessarily have the relationships with the publishing houses. Mm. So we went through this for about a year, um, you know, them not being able to really get it in front of the right people. And, you know, going back to my background, like you're saying, I'm kind of an entrepreneurial guy. And so I thought, I'm not going to wait any longer. Um, you know, so we're just going to get it out on our own. And, and part of that is learning kind of the Amazon ads, uh, you know, with the first book, which is kind of funny. The first book, we built our own database of every customer relation manager at every Barnes and Noble store. And we started blasting out emails to everybody <laughs> to the point where the corporate buyer out of New York called me up and said, OK, what's it going to take for you not to email our guys all the time? Oh, that's brilliant. And I said, <laughs> I said, we just want to do a book tour. So we ended up doing a 15 city book tour as an indie with Barnes and Noble. And, you know, that went really well. I learned a lot. Um you know, between actually doing the traditional kind of bookstore touring versus, you know, really dialing in the online platform. So, yeah, it's been a learning process. But long story short, I, I feel like I'm kind of an indie. You know, if a publisher comes along or the right agent comes along, then we'll figure it out. But so far, it's it's working for us. Yeah. And well, I think that's, that's really interesting. And uh, the waiting time is the big deal, I think, when you're used to just mm -hmm. getting stuff done, um, which I think is the big frustration. But let's circle back to the TV and film, because I know people listening want to know about pitching and yeah. about the type of books, I guess, that even get optioned. So um, mm. The Auctioneer is, you know, out at the moment with production companies. And you mentioned that the, the lady there who said, yep, this is a a great kind of fit so what yeah. are your thoughts on how an author can get optioned and also what kind of books should people try and get optioned i think you know it's because of the the streaming services that are out there now mm. uh you know for example we just had a meeting uh the other day um talking about a couple scripted shows and uh everything from like a film to a, a, a limited series. And so that whole conversation, none of, none of it had to do with pitching to cable or to the traditional networks. It was all going straight to Amazon, Netflix. When they first came out, the budgets were very low. So it was very difficult to pitch certain projects. Mm -hmm. But as we've seen in the last few years, because they're winning all kinds of awards, you know, their their budgets are relatively equivalent to what you'll find at a studio or, you know, with a cable network. So that really opens up the doors for storytellers because, you know, they're looking for all kinds of stories. And so a lot of it has to do with, um, you know, the character, the, the characters, the the plot. You know, but I think it's it's wide open. Whereas before, you know, they would look for a certain kind of genre and everyone wanted that kind of a story. I think that's completely changing right now. Um, you know, and I've seen that with, with the auctioneer. The auctioneer is out at a bunch of studios, a bunch of production companies. Um, we've got a couple uh, production companies that are very interested and in looking at it. 
Um, you know, it's a little bit like going to Vegas. You know, you kind of roll the dice, and if you're lucky enough to get an option, that doesn't mean you're going to retire. <laughs> You know, I think that's one of the big misconceptions is that people think, man, if I get my book option, I'm getting a six figure check and I'm going to just relax. And that's typically not how it works. Uh, if a book gets optioned, the option period is anywhere from 12 to 18 months. And then usually what they'll do is they'll write in kind of an additional 12 month period. So if the book actually gets into production, then they'll option it for an additional 12 months, which, you know, they pay the author for both options, which is nice. But, you know, it's not necessarily uh, six figures in, unless you're a best-selling author. So, so yeah, I mean, that's kind of what how, how we've kind of seen it progress. And, and once it's optioned, the other thing is, you know, uh, a few years back I had the opportunity to sit with Joel Gottler, and Joel was, or still is, an agent out here in L.A. He used to represent Michael Connolly. He helped uh, Michael get the deal put together with Amazon for Bosch. Mm-hmm. Um, now, Michael, for years, he had signed, when he first released kind of the Bosch series years ago, he had signed uh, an option deal over to the studios. And I think that deal was for like 20 years, every book for 20 years. Mm. Not one of those books from the Bosch series ever got made into a TV series or a, or a movie. It wasn't until Michael got the option back and kind of ran with it on his own that they were able to put a deal together. So, you know, so but typically, you know, within 12 to 18 months, you'll know if anything is going to happen, mm. you know. Yeah, and that's a really important point. And I was going to mention there's a book called Hollywood versus the Author. Have you mm-hmm. seen? Yeah, and Michael Connolly writes in that book about getting the Bosch uh, back, and he had to pay the studio something like yeah, three, had- three million or four million for it. But luckily, the Amazon deal paid off, and Bosch is doing really well. And but it was interesting because, of course, he, he's a very successful author who can afford that type of money. But it's fascinating because, yeah. as you say, having it tied up with an option doesn't necessarily mean it's going to go into production or that it's going to be successful. Um, you know. Th- so so that's something that is really important for authors to realize, I think. In fact, don't, lots of people get optioned, but very few things get made. Yeah, because, you know, the, the flip side of it on the inside of, of Hollywood mm-hmm. is sometimes they'll option a book if it's similar to something else that they already have in development. And so they'll option it not to do anything with it, but just to keep it off the streets, you know, they'll they'll hang on to it so that it doesn't interfere with something else they already have in production. So I've I've seen that happen. And so, you know, I would say if you're if you're going down that route, you know, as an indie, I don't know if, if you know, people listening, if you know, if you have an agent, that's really great, a literary agent, because they'll be able to help kind of walk you through that. Um, but my other advice would be if someone approaches you and it, it's, you know, Google's a great thing. You can Google the producer, the production company. You can look at their credits. You can see if they're really legit. And then if they are legit and they actually make you an offer, it's definitely worth spending the money to take it to an entertainment attorney and say, okay, what am I signing? You know, how is it going to limit me? And then the other thing that you have to do, which this could be hard for us creative types, you know, um, is as an author, typically when they option the book, from that point forward, if it does get into development or does get into production, um, you're hands off typically, you know. So I've talked with a lot of authors that are like, you know, I don't want to. I don't want to sign an option deal unless I'm a producer and I'm a writer and I'm, I'm all these things. And in a perfect world, that would be great, you know. But in reality, you have to be willing to let it go, you know. I, I listened to a really good podcast. Uh, I would think it was last year sometime, with uh, John Grisham and Harlan Coben, and they were talking about kind of the whole thing with getting books option and everything. 
And they had the best advice ever. They said, look, if you can get an option, that's great. You know, walk away from it after you sign it and get as much money as you can up front, you know. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Do you remember what podcast that was? Because I know people will want to know. It was, uh, I forget what it was called, but when uh, Grisham did the book tour last year, like he hadn't done a book tour in like 20 years, you know. Mm. When he did the book tour, they recorded a podcast at every one of those stops. Ah, so it might be so, his website or something. Yeah, yeah, definitely go to his website because it's definitely on there. And then he had like guest authors come in and they talked about all kinds of stuff from social media to the TV film thing and all that. Ah, that, that sounds cool. Okay, so just circling back again. So do you, yeah. so one question, should authors if they want to try and pitch to film or TV, should they be trying to adapt their novel or should they be doing something like a treatment or should they just be doing a pitch? And what, I guess, what do those mean if people don't understand? Yeah, I would say um, your book is your best uh, lead in. Um, Depending on the production company, depending on the producer, a lot of times, you know, they may not have time to read a 300 page book. So what we've done is we'll send the book. I've got a 12 page treatment. That is the complete story with all, it gives away everything, all the surprises, all the hooks, you know, I know, you know, sometimes authors are always like, I don't want to give them everything. It's like, they need to know every detail in a summary form. Mm -hmm. And then what we'll do is we'll do kind of a one paragraph summary of the story with uh, a tagline at the top, which is kind of our hook. So when we send it out to someone, because an agent will look at it differently, a producer, a director, an actor, a studio, everyone's looking at it from a different point of view. So sometimes the one paragraph deal is good enough to get you a meeting. Um, But, you know, for a producer, they want to know, okay, I like the characters. I like kind of how the story begins. How's this thing going to flow out over, you know, 110 pages? Mm. And so give them the 12 page treatment, you know, or it might be less than 12, but for us, it was 12 pages. Give them that treatment and they can read that in 15 minutes and know, okay, is this something that we're interested in? Um, The other thing we've done with the auctioneer is we've kind of set this up to kind of go the distance. So, we're not only pitching it as, to studios for a film, but we're also pitching it as a TV series because I think the characters and kind of the way the story unfolds, it could definitely go, you know, five seasons, which that's the goal for those listening. If you're pitching a, a book to television, that story's got to go at least five seasons. Mm-hmm. You know, 100 episodes is the magic number. Because once it goes 100 episodes, then it goes into syndication. And what that means is now that show can get sold to other networks around the world. And that, as we call uh, out here, is that's the, the gift that keeps on giving. So, <laughs> Yeah, which sounds uh, amazing. So I'm interested in the treatment there. I've done a little bit of this kind of thing. And mm. uh, with the treatment for a TV series versus a film, for example, so in the TV yeah. series treatment, would you be outlining um, your ideas for presumably not 100 episodes, but at least how that might continue over five series? Because most people may have only written a couple of books or even one yeah. book. Um, so yeah. ha- how would that treatment work? Um, kind of the approach would be this, like if we're looking at TV and film. So with film, typically as you're writing the script, you'll have a three-act structure to the film script. Uh, with the TV side, with a pilot, for example, that's a five act structure. So even writing those two, it's a completely different process. Um, with television, you are really condensing things down. Um, but at the same time, you're having to watch kind of your story arcs because you don't want your story arcs to happen too fast and run out of gas before the end of a 13 or 22 episode season. Um, you know, So my advice would be with the pilot, I would take your book and say, okay, I want to write a pilot. So I'm going to write a TV pilot. 
that pilot's going to be about 52 pages. Um, it'll have five acts, uh, you know, and the pilot is introducing the viewers to your world, you know, the world you're creating, setting the stakes for what's going to happen in season one. And then it's also um, kind of introducing people to the characters, but not getting too deep. You just want to get them hooked just enough. So if you look at your book, that may only be the first however many chapters of your book, you know. But in addition to that, as part of the, the TV side, um, we put together what we call a show Bible. And so in the show Bible, we'll have character profiles, like very detailed kind of history on the characters. For season one, we'll write episode summaries. So say it's a 13-episode season, we'll write a summary for each episode. just tells you here's basically what's going to happen. What that helps a studio look at is here's the overall story arc for season one. And then what we'll do is we'll write, uh, you know, it's kind of like a treatment. We'll write a treatment for here's the overall arc of the entire show. Mm. And so here's how we go to five, you know, to season five. And it's not necessarily giving away detailed plots because you may not know what those are, but we know the main character. So like in the auctioneer, the main character is Chase Hardiman. We know in season one, here's where you find Chase, right? He's an ex covert operative. He comes back home to take over the family business, which is an auctioning company. Something happens in the pilot episode that throws all that, you know, kind of into chaos. But, when we get to season five, here's where Chase is going to be in season five. And so they want to know that it's just not going to be a linear character the entire way through. They want to know that you've got the twists, the turns, the surprises, you know, what other characters will kind of evolve in those seasons. Um, and a lot of times the pilot is enough to get you in the door. Uh, the other difference would be like with film, you might write a script completely by yourself, you know, until you turn it into a producer, a director that makes some notes in television. Typically, you know, writers find themselves in a writer's room. And so you're in a room with eight other people that have completely different ideas than what you may have thought. Mm. So, you know, that show Bible is kind of a living, breathing document. Um, but, as a as an author who's pitching to these you know avenues the one thing i've learned is the more that you can come to the table with the better you know and this is where i take off the writer's hat and put on the producer hat mm. because if you can attach talent to it if you can uh you know if you can write a pilot script you know you have to that's everyone's got to judge that for themselves can they actually do it you know, if you're coming to the table with those things or some people come with a distribution, you know, opportunity, the more that you come with as you pitch the project, the more you can stay in the game. You know, like we said earlier, if you're an author and you sign an option, you're you're out of the mix. They're mm -hmm. going to take it over. But if you can give them a reason for you to stick around, you know, like. Michael Connolly's done exactly that. He's in the writer's room. He's figuring out how they mesh all of his books into a season on Bosch. Mm. You know, and he, he knows the characters so well, they want him when they're filming because he, he's got Harry Bosch in his brain, you know, and so that makes him valuable. And so I think those are things for writers to think about is if I do write a pilot or I have a book that I'm trying to option, what else can I bring to the table that will that will keep me in the room? You know, mm, if if you want to go in the room, and I think that's a yeah, yeah totally a, a big something for people to think about, as you say. So let's assume um, because I really got into this, and part of me still really wants to write scripts, and I just I loved the drafts that I've done, but it's a whole new way of writing and yeah. a whole new relationship thing and a whole new networking thing and so what I wanted to ask you is there are a lot of 
different well let's let's say there are a lot of services out there that will pitch mm. supposedly for you and over the years i've seen a lot of these come and go and some are good some are bad some seem a rip off some seem excellent and there's a new yeah. one that uh, as we speak has only kind of just come on my radar which is called tailflick.com mm -hmm. and yeah. uh, i and you and i just had a quick word beforehand and i've submitted to it it looks pretty awesome at a reasonable price but i wondered what do you think of tail flick and uh, any thoughts on submission sites like that sure um i would say just out of the gate there's three things that come to mind the first thing is uh pitching traditionally you know you used to have to go through one of the big agents caa william morris mm -hmm. getting in with those guys is nearly impossible mm -hmm. unless you have a track record so you know fortunately uh, for me over the years i've met different people uh you know one amazing story because not that i would say everyone should go out and do this but just for the auctioneer we went on linkedin on my linkedin account and we emailed a select group of producers studio guys um, to invite them to the release event now, out of that, I had two uh, production companies reach out to me to read the auctioneer, and there are some of the ones that are in the mix. So you never know where it might come from, you know. And if you reach out kind of in not uh, like an overbearing way, mm -hmm. people are pretty open, you know. You don't want to send like five emails in the first week going, you know, can you get back to me? You put it out there, you see how they react. Um, but with that said, you know, one suggestion for authors is if you find a literary agent that has experience in the TV film side, that's a, you know, that's a bonus. But I also did tailflick.com because I wanted to test them out and just see kind of how the process worked. And up until now, I think the biggest kind of piece that was missing was you upload your book, you upload all the information. But then you have no feedback. You don't know if you're getting hits on your page. You don't, you don't know if anyone's even looking at it. You know, so then you got to wonder: Do I pay the annual fee? You know, when I don't even know what's really happening. Well, I've reached out to Tailflick a few times over the last few months and got a response. Uh, you know, each time they're great at responding. I think they're building the platform, mm -hmm. so I think it's going to be evolving. And so their next stage is they're going to be uh, releasing a new platform within the next couple of weeks. Um, they don't have a final date, but it's, it's on its way. And it's a marketplace where you can reach producers and screenwriters directly. Now, for everyone listening, you don't know how huge of a deal that is. Because it's like I'm telling you, it's nearly impossible unless you have existing relationships. So this is a huge thing. And they're going to give authors the ability to write and promote your own pitch. Uh, so that means you can, you can craft the pitch the way you want it. That pitch will then be visible to producers and studios to search. Um, but I think the real big thing is the marketplace where – Sure, you write the pitch, you put it up there. Now you don't have to wonder. Now you can actually follow up and do the things that you would do to try and get it in front of people. So, you know, from what it looks like on the outside, it looks like this change that they're making is going to be really good. So I would, you know, for 88 bucks, I would try it. Yes, and as we record this in April 2019, that's the price. Yeah. But I bet you that won't be the price long term. Yeah, so. no, no kidding. They're saying we're we're launching a new marketplace, and you're like, all right, what's uh, that yeah. going to cost? You but know? but this, is, this is interesting. So uh, I have also done it, um, and I up, you know, you upload the book, and everything's fine. And then they ask for your logline, and they don't prepare you for this. And I know many authors mm -hmm. listening. You might have heard of a logline. People might have heard of that, but most authors authors have trouble crafting the back blurb or the sales description for Amazon, let alone a logline. So I wonder yeah. if you could maybe give us a, because as far as I understand it, the logline is pretty much the pitch and most, yeah. you know, most of it. So tips for a, a good logline, considering they allow, I think, 300 characters or something. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would say this, I go through a process with each of the books or, you know, I, I think I mentioned with you, 
we've got, uh, I've written three pilots that are making the rounds. And so, you know, writing the book or writing the pilot, yeah, that's a lot of work. That takes months, you know, if not years for some people. But once I get it done, it's like you start the compression. Mm -hmm. So I'll take the book, I'll compress it down to like that 12 page treatment. And then I'll compress it down to that paragraph and getting it down to that log line, which is no more than two sentences, basically. Mm -hmm. That is probably the hardest process because you're trying to figure out how do I, how do I tell them what the story is in two sentences? And so my thing would be is to take your author hat off and put your marketing hat on. And so you're trying to sell this now. Now you're trying to sell this to those people that are interested. So you got to think of how do you make it either intriguing, exciting, like all those emotions. And, you know, it could take you a couple of weeks to write that log line. You know, I mean, there's there's really I wish I could say there's like a formula and really easy way to do it. But I would do that. The other thing that we do that really helps and you had mentioned it at the very top of the, the podcast is, you know, the auctioneer. Think Jason Bourne meets James Bond meets National Treasure. Right away, someone can picture in their mind. Here's here's what I'm seeing. And so I would almost write the two sentence log line. And then at the end of it, which I did this on tail flick at the end of it, you write think colon and then think of two or three movies, TV shows, mm -hmm. something that's that's current or very successful. And I would put those at the end of your log line mm -hmm. because for, you know, for a studio exec or for a, a producer, that just cuts right to it, you know? So it's like Chase Hardiman, ex-covert operative, you know, returns home to take over the family business and all chaos ensues. Think Jason Bourne meets James Bond meets National Treasure, you know? Yeah, and it's interesting you say that because uh, I did a pitch at a, a thing and uh, the, the agent said to me, wow, that's a great pitch. That would cost around $200 million <laughs> <laughs> to make. And he said, maybe start with something that is a low budget, say a low budget horror. And that was an interesting response because similar to you, I write kind of big scale books yeah, and I blow yeah. big things up. And, <laughs> and that was really interesting feedback. So um, do you think that's a tip too like I'm I'm I've got like a lot of books now and I've uploaded one mm. to tail flick and I'm thinking about uploading another one which would be cheaper so is budget something to keep in mind yeah big time I mean that's what they're looking at so even you know like when we write the books where our imagination can go wild right there's no limit there's no budget we're just we're gonna write the biggest best kind of blockbuster we can when you get into writing say you're gonna take that book and you're going to put it into a film or a TV series, the budget has to constantly be playing in your mind. Mm -hmm. So there's certain things in the auctioneer that would not make it into the film script. You know, and then there's even more things in the auctioneer that would not make it into a TV script. Mm -hmm. And why is that? Because of the budgets. You know, so if you come out of the gate, like you're saying, you know, you come out of the gate with a $200 million movie, well, unless you're, you know, a very successful screenwriter, unless you got a track record, everyone's looking at it going, oh, okay, I'm not sure. You know, you have the ones that do happen, you know, the Hunger Games, you know, some of those ones that hit, but look at the number of ones that don't. But that was so, a big book first. Hunger Games was a big book. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But I mean, when she was, when they were first going out with it, you know, I, I could almost guarantee you they were pitching the book before it got released because mm. that's typically how this works um, is mm. even before it hits the shelves because the publishers are going to leverage what the studios will do. So even before the book is out, that, script, that manuscript is making the rounds because everything takes forever. You know, mm. so do you, you know, sorry, that, just on, on that, is that important? Because I noticed another field I was surprised about on Tail Flick was the year the book was published. Yeah. So, it, do you think um, new things are important, or do you think they'll be looking for stories in general? 
I think it's just stories in general. Because say a, a book gets into production, you know, you've optioned it, uh, the studios come up with the money, now you've got to write the script and all that. That's, you know, that could be a five year process. So I don't think it matters so much when the book was released. I think for, you know, part of what they're going to look at, they might look at sales on the book, you know, so they want to know, okay, it came out in 2016 and it sold 100,000 copies. Okay, you know, that's that's decent. But what they're really looking for is they're looking for stories that are unique and are producible, Mm -hmm. you know. And like, like what you said earlier, the budget can play a big factor. And so, you know, what you might want to do, for example, uh, with your treatment is, you know, the 12-page treatment that you send out, you may want to write two versions of that, you know, one for the film side, one for the TV side, you know, or if you you want to go strictly film, write two treatments, write a high-budget treatment, Mm -hmm. write write a lower budget treatment. You know, because that's the at the end of the day, they've got to be able to, you know, everyone wants to make money. The studio wants to make money. So, Mm. you know, they want to know that they want to leverage their bets that they're going to make their money back in a a profit. Yeah. And it's so interesting because, you know, often when we're marketing our books, we're thinking about the reader and we're trying to be in the reader's head. And what you're saying is you need to be in the head of the producer, the director, whoever's buying uh, and what they want. And they want, yeah. you know, and they're not going to read the book, are they? They never, they don't read the book. Yeah. That's not what they do. So you have yeah. to p- pitch things in a way that they understand. Um, yeah. So any, any, we're almost out of time. I feel like I could oh, talk, no. <laughs> talk to you for ages about this stuff. Any oh, other, anything else that you think authors should know about this kind of uh, pitching process, or, or, or what, what happens next? You know, I would say. Uh, I would say on the pit, on the writing side, that's that's probably the biggest thing is you've written your book and maybe that's just the way you write, you know. Um, don't feel like you have to write a pilot. Mm. You know, a lot of times people think, well, I need to write the pilot for the movie before I get someone interested. I think what we've been talking about today, it's much better use of your time and it's actually can position you in a better way. If you write the treatments, you know, in the long form, short form, the log line, so that it's easy, depending on who you're pitching it to, you've got to be sensitive to that, you know, because they want to be able to get to it quick. So they're not going to, like you said, not read the whole book, but you know, the flip side is if you do write a pilot and it's not very good or it doesn't technically, there's a lot of technical things in the, in the, the pilot or the, the feature script that you have to know, like certain things in a feature script have to happen on certain pages. So if you don't know that and you just write the movie and, and it reads kind of similar to like your book, when you send it out, that's your first impression. That's the impression they're going to get. You know, oh, no, we've got an author now that wants to write a feature film, right? So you kind of have to decide what what role you want to play, you know? Mm-hmm. And so I would say spend the time to really condense those down. And, you know, LinkedIn is a great way to find uh, production companies and people that are out there, you know, search online. Almost all the production companies have some kind of a contact, you know, where you can at least talk to somebody, maybe not the decision maker, but at least find out who those people are. Um, And and what we did with the auctioneer is before it even got released, we sent out, I don't know, probably 50 books with exactly what I'm talking about to the studios, uh, production companies. You know, another little tip would be, and this is a little bit of a longer shot, but it's worked before, um, is find actors, not necessarily the A-list actors, but find actors that are making their way kind of up the ranks, you know. So you're not at the Tom Cruise level, but you're at the Christopher Pine level, right? Most of those guys these days, especially with the streaming services, 
they have their own production companies. And so instead of going to a big studio like Warner Brothers or, you know, or Universal, you go to those production companies because if that actor reads what you're sending and it gets them thinking, oh, this is something that I could star in and I can executive produce and I can get points on the back end. You know, they start thinking about the business side of it Mm -hmm. and they're bringing something to a studio that they already have a deal with. That's a that's another way, uh, you know, an, another way to do it. Mm, super. Well, so many ideas coming out of this, <laughs> and I know people will be excited. Um, so, where can people find uh, your author site and your books and everything you do online? Yeah, djwilliamsbooks.com. That's where that's where all of it lives, and and uh, I'm working on the next one, next the next uh, sequel to the auctioneer book already. And while we're shopping these pilots. So, you know, when you get turned down on the pilots, you feel a little better when you can write when you get home. (laughs) (laughs) And as we said, it takes a long time. So just keep on writing. (laughs) Yeah, definitely. So thanks so much for your time, Derek. That was great. Awesome. Thanks, Joanna.